Hello, and welcome to my session, Cluster API as Code. My name is David McKay, and I am a CNCF ambassador and senior developer advocate for Equinix Metal. And I am from Glasgow in sunny, sunny Scotland. I have a menagerie of animals in my office. I have chinchillas, dagas, a ferret, and a dog. I'm also a prolific live streamer, streaming multiple times per week, trying to cover all of the cloud native landscape technologies, hopefully providing learning materials so we can all learn together. And of course, I'm also sporting my wonderful COVID hair. You're welcome. And I am definitely a member of the Pineapple Pizza Club. So let's get started. So what is Cluster API project? Well, it is a sub-project of Kubernetes that aims to commoditize the creation and provisioning of new Kubernetes clusters, provided you have a Kubernetes cluster. The Cluster API provides a declarative API, just like we're used to with Kubernetes, for managing our Kubernetes clusters. Its responsibilities are to create and provision Kubernetes clusters. It will handle upgrades and day-to-day -day operations, including remediation when required. It is currently in an alpha state, which means it's volatile and changing quickly, but it doesn't mean that you can't use it in production today. And it is an extremely collaborative project with members from AWS, DigitalOcean, Google Cloud, Equinix Metal, and more. Almost every cloud provider has a cluster API provider for spinning up that next Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so let's cover some basic vocabulary that you need to get started with the cluster API. Firstly, the documentation will make mention of a management cluster. This can be an existing Kubernetes cluster that you have available within your organization or something as simple as Docker for Mac, Minikube, or Kind. This cluster will run the controllers for creating subsequent or target workload clusters. The documentation will also mention infrastructure providers. The cluster API aims to work across all major cloud providers. So the provider could be Google, Amazon, or Equinix Metal. Hmm. Mm. Perfect. And then there's the workload cluster. The workload cluster is the cluster that we're going to have the cluster API create and provision for us. Then we have machines. These could be virtual machines or VMs on AWS, GCP, or bare metal instances on Equinix Metal. We then have the concept of a machine deployment. This is a high level request for the cluster API to create one or more machines. The machine deployment is responsible for maintaining and creating machine sets. As we make changes to our machine deployments, new machine sets are created. The machine sets are then responsible for creating the machines. We also have machine health checks to make sure that the clusters and the nodes that we provide are always healthy. This should feel extremely familiar. This is very similar to the resources that we work with day in and day out on Kubernetes. Deployments, replica sets, pods, and probes. Okay, now that that stuff's out the way, let's take a very brief look at how you get started with the Cluster API today. I'm going to quickly run through the Getting Started Guide from the Cluster API book. If you haven't checked out the book, I recommend doing so as soon as possible. It has everything you need to know about getting started with the Cluster API. So what we have here is a very simple just file. Just files like a make file, but better. It has two different targets. The first init, this will prepare our management cluster for creating new Kubernetes clusters. Next, there's a create cluster target. This one's a little bit more verbose, but this will generate the YAML required for us to apply to our management cluster in order to allow the controllers to create our new workload cluster. We specify the Kubernetes version that we want, how many control plane nodes we want, and how many worker nodes we want. 
you don't have to worry about having a single control plane node or a highly available control plane node. Cluster API will take care of that for you. And in order for these just valid targets to work, we just need a little bit of environment information to configure it along the way. Of course, we need to provide an API key for the cloud provider of choice. Because I'm using Equinix Metal, I also have to provide which project to create the devices in. And I also have to tell it which operating system to use for each of the nodes, as well as the facility to launch them in. We can configure the pod cider and service cider for our cluster. And we can tell it which instance types to use individually for the control plane node and for any worker node pools that we have. To get started, I can run just in it. This will speak to my management cluster, which is Docker for Mac. It will install all of the custom resources to that cluster, get the controllers running, and pass in the packet API key that I need for deploying new clusters on Equinix Metal. It's called Packet just because Packet renamed to Equinix Metal last year and the provider is a little bit behind. It's not the quickest, but it is pulling a number of images to the management cluster. However, that is now available for me to generate my target cluster. Cluster Control uses templates that are baked into each provider's repository to try and guess what you need for your target cluster. And in fact, we can pop this open in VS Code and take a look. Now, inside of our cluster YAML, you will see a Cube ADM control plane. This is a custom resource that tells Cluster API how to get a control plane node on your provider of choice. Here we see a whole bunch of shell commands that are required to configure the host and install all of the Kubernetes components. We then have a machine template that tells us what our control plane nodes look like. We then have a cluster CRD that contains each of the pod cider, service cider, and other infrastructure parts that we need, followed by a provider specific cluster that just tells it the facility and project IDs. We then have machine deployments, more machine templates, more QBDM configs, and there we are 206 lines of wonderful, beautiful YAML. Okay, let's get started. What's the problem? Seems simple enough, right? Unfortunately, YAML is not the best programming language for complex logic. And we seem to have got ourselves into a bit of a pickle in the cloud native ecosystem when it comes to YAML. In fact, there are memes all over the internet about how, you know, to be a DevOps engineer, to be a platform engineer, be a Kubernetes developer is to be a YAML developer. And while they're funny, sometimes incorrect, and a whole bunch of other things, it does identify a real problem that we have, that we've gotten ourselves into. We've got Helm, we've got Carvel, we've got Capitan, we have Customize to help us try and wrangle this YAML into something that is much more fluent to work with that allows us to handle complex logic and loops and <laughs> templating. Uh, and I think it's safe to say, you know, if, if you maintain any Helm charts, I, I certainly do, it can be overwhelming because those Helm charts, which are trying to set out a predefined way or a best practice way for deploying a piece of software, doesn't fit everyone's use case. People want to do their own thing. And we layer and layer on more loops, more conditionals, more loops and more conditionals, trying to provide enough flexibility for the end user while saving them time, but at the expense of everyone's time. And there has to be a better way. So I reached out to my colleague, Jason Tsebris, who just happens to be a contributor and maintainer of various cluster API projects. And I won't read his words verbatim. Feel free to hit pause and, and do that of your own accord. Uh, 
But I think the message from Jason is clear. The Custer API's responsibility is the reconciliation, creation, provision, and operability of the target clusters. The cluster API's responsibility is not to provide, you know, ergonomic tooling to generate the YAML to describe those clusters. And as we've seen through the quick start, while it does offer some simple mechanics to generate that getting started uh, YAML, the minute you need to be able to make your own tweaks, things get a little bit complicated. You have to start copying and pasting your own YAML to get the kind of cluster topology that you would want or expect. Yeah, fine, it gives you a control plane cluster, highly available. But it only generates one single worker pool. And for most production clusters, you're probably going to want more, potentially within different availability zones within a single region, with a variety of instance types, some disk heavy, some memory heavy, some CPU heavy, that really are tailored to your workload. We're seeing the, the same confusion and complexity that we see across the broader Kubernetes ecosystem for deployments and templating now starting to come to the cluster API. This is that not all clusters are the same. And as an end user, I want to describe a cluster that works for me. And for that, we need to look beyond the cluster API to other tools. Okay. Let's talk about solutions. If we have to look beyond the cluster API for tooling to allow us to define the clusters that we need and we want for our day-to-day -day lives to be better, then we have to look at other toolings. Then, then we have to pick the right tooling. And I am a firm believer in infrastructure as code, not as YAML, as code using real high-level languages that allow us to provide the abstractions that we need to make our jobs almost enjoyable. And, and that means that I want something that is flexible. I, I want to be able to define a cluster that is the size I want, that uses the node pools I want, that uses the instant types I want, that has the operating system that I want to use because maybe there's other things on there that I want to take advantage of. I think more importantly, it also has to be composable. I, th I think that we are in a stage of Kubernetes awareness and adoption where we know that having one giant monolithic Kubernetes cluster is not the answer. We actually want lots of smaller Kubernetes clusters and our tooling has to evolve to help us provide that and describe that. So when I say composable, it's like I want to be able to define what a node pool looks like for machine learning workloads and reuse that over and over again. I want to be able to define what a node pool looks like for databases, for stateful workloads, where disk IOPS are critical and security across the board. And it has to be ergonomic. I have to enjoy using it. Coding doesn't have to be a chore. We provide abstractions and libraries to make our lives easier. I want to make future me life easier. And there is a way. So the solution I'm going to show today is based on a project called Polyby, which hopefully you're aware of. It is an infrastructure as code tool. So it allows you, the developer, to make your own choices. You want to write your infrastructure as code in Python? Go. JavaScript. TypeScript, .NET. These are all choices you get to make. Lumi allows you and provides an SDK to work with a language that you're more comfortable with. And what we have here is an example of using the TypeScript SDK for Azure to spin up an app service, which has a handler and anonymous function. My business logic can go there and then just four lines of code to describe how to deploy that to the Azure ecosystem. And these are the ergonomics that we're talking about. Less than 10 lines of code, easy to read, easy to reason, easy to change. It's very explicit and does only what I need. There's another project from the Polymi Corporation 
that allows us to generate these types from the custom resource definitions that are widely available in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I'm not confined to V1 or apps V1 that are already broadly known and understood, but to any custom resource that is online that has an open API specification as part of its resource. Pulumi can generate the types and allow us to consume them using the same ergonomics that we're becoming accustomed to. As I said, Pulumi supports the languages that you're already familiar with. I'm a big fan of using TypeScript. I think it works really well for infrastructure as code with its strongly typed but dynamic nature. However, this is cloud native. Go is an option, as long as you don't mind checking for errors every 13 seconds. Python and .NET are also available, and more languages I've heard are coming soon. And there's one secret thing that launched very recently from the Pulumi Corporation. And it's that they have enabled cross-language SDK runtime capability. Meaning, I like TypeScript. I publish libraries in TypeScript. You like Go. You want to write your infrastructure as code, then Go. You can now consume the TypeScript libraries from Go, as I can consume the, type, the Go library from TypeScript. Wow. So for the rest of this talk, we're going to be moving into the live demo where I will show you the library that I've built and how it allows you to define Kubernetes clusters with great ergonomics, composability, and extremely flexible. Okay, let's take a look. So what I have here is a brand new Lumi project inside of my KubeCon directory. It's configured for Kubernetes and TypeScript, which means that it comes with the Pulumi SDK, Kubernetes SDK, and some Kubernetes helpers. In my own namespace, I have access to all of the cluster API resources that I've already generated and published. The first thing I'm going to do is just pull in the cluster API generic package. From here, we can open our index.typescript, and we want to import star as capi from our new library. Now, one of the more difficult things to automate with the cluster API is that initial infrastructure provision. Because the only way to do it is through a cluster control init dash dash infrastructure packet. It then requires a secret to exist in the environment that tells the controllers how to speak to the cloud provider. Cluster control does not provide a way to generate the YAML and store that for a GitOps fashion. However, the library I provided does ship with helpers to initialize your provider in your management cluster. So the first thing we want to do is initialize the cluster API. And we can do <laughs> we can do that through a call to init. Now, one of the really nice things about working with TypeScript is that you don't need to know the SDKs up front because the language server protocols are all really, really good. And in fact, I can just type capi dot and already I can see the API space that is available for me to use. Now, I'm not quite ready to create a cluster. So I'm just going to do init. And I don't know what parameters this function takes, but I open my parameters and I can see Oh, the inner function takes a cluster API config. Hmm. Do we know what a cluster API config is? Well, not yet. But we can expand that, use our autocomplete, and we can see, oh, it wants to know whether we should install Cert Manager. And if so, which version? It also wants to know whether we want to enable any of the feature data. And finally, it needs a Kubernetes provider. So let's just quickly run through this one by one. When we did the cluster control in it earlier, we did see that it installed Cert Manager. In fact, it's required. So I'm just going to say true. Yeah, why not install Cert Manager? What version? Well, I already know that 110 is available, so I'm just going to drop that straight in. But you could find that from the cluster, from the cert manager GitHub repository. Next, 
Oh, feature case. Well, we can hover over and we know that it expects a list of something called a feature case. So let's just pop open our list and click on feature gate. And we can see there's two features available for us to enable. We don't need to know what our machine pool is yet, but I am going to enable cluster resource set. Cluster resource sets are a way for you to define manifest to deploy to your new target clusters or workload clusters when they become available. And can I get up? And finally, we need a Kubernetes provider. I'm going to leave this blank for just a moment. And that's it. That will enable the cluster API controllers on my management cluster. However, I've not provided the dash dash infrastructure provider yet. Let's do that next. So we're going to pull in one more import. We have to go to our package.json and add one more package. This time, I'm going to add the packet provider. We can run a yarn install, and that'll just take a moment. OK, now we can come back and complete this. We're going to pull in the packet provider. Again, we don't know the API up front, but we can say packet capy equals cap dot. And again, we have the ability to create a control plane or initialize the management cluster. Just like before, it needs a config. Okay, so let's take care of that API key first. One of the really great things about using Pulumi for infrastructure as code is inbuilt secret management. That means I can just say blank string for now jump up to the top of my file and import the Pulumi library. From here, I can create a new config object. I'm going to call this the config metal, which is a new Pulumi config with a prefix of Equinix metal. I can then say here, config metal dot require secret off token. And that's it. What's actually happening here is that our Pulumi stack is configured with a secret provider. That can be a cloud KMS from AWS, GCP, or anywhere else. Or it can be a password-protected local provider. I can open the Pulumi production environment, and we see our prefix of Equinix Metal, and we see a key of off token. And here we have an encrypted version of our API token which is all that has been consumed here. Next, we need a cluster API. What is that? Well, we can hover over and see that it's just looking for some providers that come from our CAPI init. Our CAPI init actually returns a set of manifests. So from here, we can say cluster API, not cluster API. And finally, there's a Kubernetes provider. We ignored that above, but we're going to take care of it now. So all we need to do is create a new Kubernetes provider. For that, we import the Kubernetes package. And we can create a new case dot provider. We can see here that it needs a name. We'll just call this local. Now we can add our Kubernetes provider to both of our edits. And that is it. Now we can run this Pulumi program to provision cluster API controllers to a Kubernetes cluster. So of course, I won't make you take my word for it. Let's actually run this. We'll pop over here, jump to the terminal, and we're going to run the Lumi up. It's going to work out from those functions that we provided, which resource have to be created within the management cluster. You can see that there's a fair few. We can hit yes and give it just a few moments, and it will begin applying these 
to the cluster. Now, one of the things that Pulumi does is try to ensure that what we apply will actually become healthy. That means that it's probably going to sit there for quite a while while it waits to make sure that the deployments and the images are pulled, the pods are passing all the probes, the services have endpoints, all of those little bits and pieces that normally we just allow the Kubernetes reconciliation loop to take care of. So I'm just going to click Control C a couple of times. <laughs> and I'm going to run get pods all. Maybe. There we go. And we'll see we have cert manager and we have our CAPI controllers and we even have the packet controller manager. Not quite ready yet, but getting there. And I control see that because I'm not fussed about a letter finishing. I want to show you an alternative approach that may better fit your workflow. Okay, so let's jump back into our code. And where we created our Kubernetes provider, we're going to make a few small tweaks. We're going to open up the arguments. And we're going to see that we have a bunch of things that we can tweak with the Kubernetes provider. For one, it doesn't have to use whichever context is available to me in the environment. I can provide my own kubeconfig. I can specify a namespace that I want to deploy to, or I can render YAML. We can say rendered YAML. Now we can come to the command line and run Pulumi up. And instead of reaching out to that cluster, checking which resources exist, waiting for health checks and services and have endpoints and liveness probes to pass, we can just click yes and allow Pulumi to write a bunch of YAML to a directory that we can apply whenever we want. Just that simple. And that's it. We can pop open VS Code. We'll see this brand new render YAML directory. We can see the CRDs that need to be applied to the cluster, as well as all of the manifests with all of the resources that have to exist. And that's not all. It's just the beginning. As well as installing cluster API as the providers to our cluster, we can add and layer on more abstractions to make our lives easier. You can see that there's already the ability to create a control plane on an Equinix Metal cluster that has the configuration options that an Equinix Metal customer would come to expect. The project ID, the number of replicas, the machine types, the facility, and the image. And of course, it's not Equinix Metal specific. And in fact, we can take a look at CAPD, which is the digital ocean provider. Again, using just a simple init command and a config, we can provide the access token the cluster API manifest and the Kubernetes provider, just like we did earlier, to make DigitalOcean Kubernetes clusters available to us on our management cluster. There's no reason we can't support AWS, GCP, and all the other major cloud providers. It just requires a little bit of effort to put together these abstractions. Okay, let's head back to the slides. Okay, so what's coming next? Well, the CD Kates is a really, really cool project. It's, it's very similar to Pulumi in that it exposes a multi language or runtime for defining and creating Kubernetes resources. Generating the types is actually a lot easier with CD Kates than it is in Pulumi. It doesn't require an external command. But there are some trade offs from both approaches. As we've seen with Pulumi, we can use Pulumi's runtime to speak to the Kubernetes cluster and do the apply. This allows us to take advantage of Pulumi's inbuilt secrets management. This protects our access tokens and API keys from being rendered to YAML and available even ephemerally in some location. And CDK doesn't have that, just as Pulumi doesn't have it when we render to YAML too. So it could be a good idea to install and edit the cluster API and the providers 
via Pulumi, but then use CT kits and Pulumi's abstractions to generate the YAML to define each unique cluster. That's up to you. And I'd like to see more use of Open Policy Agent for testing the clusters that we are creating. The Pulumi SDK that I provided applies some basic tests to ensure that all of the feature gates are interpolated before they hit your management cluster. But there's a lot more that we can do there too. And I'd like to see more providers. I'd like types generated for AWS and for GCP and maybe even Oracle Cloud. Who knows? And I think what we really need is more abstraction more helper functions to create unique cluster configurations for machine learning, for computer intensive workloads, for stateful workloads, more abstractions and higher level functions that can make all of our lives easier. One of the really cool things about Cluster API is cluster resource sets. The ability in the management cluster to say when we have a new healthy cluster created, we should go and apply a set of resources. These are a little finicky to work with because you have to actually encapsulate the deployments, the services, the config maps, the secrets for those individual workloads into a config map itself. And this is exactly where abstractions like this can make our lives easier. So that's my talk. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Not only does the tooling that I've shown today for Cluster API exist and can better our lives, but it's not confined to Cluster API either. There's no reason we can't use CDKs and Pulumi across our entire deployment surface for Kubernetes. So there's still a lot to be done, a lot of challenges to solve, and a lot of things we can make simpler. I can't wait to see what you do with it. Best of luck. Have a great day.